Alright, so um, guys, so I've already introduced myself. Uh, each week at Google, we, uh, we're big fans of, of containers at Google. Each week we launch 2 billion containers per week and then also decommission probably hopefully about 2 billion containers per week. <laughs> um, so you might say that we know a little something about how to run containers at scale, like large amounts of containers. We are extremely excited that the rest of the world is falling in love with containers. Um, that these really smart people have doc at Docker have come up with something so cool, so easy to use, it's making all of you passionate about it. And as we agree with you, the containers are a great way to abstract the workloads you're doing from the underlying infrastructure. But we can see you're running into the same lessons that we have run into over the years about running containers at scale is difficult. Achieving high reliability at scale is difficult. Uh, one example of that is, you know, how do you scale up? What happens, how do you handle replication of your containers across nodes and make sure that they're well distributed, that they can find each other, that the services can find each other? What happens if a node fails? How do you make sure it comes back up? What happens if a container itself fails? How do you handle rolling upgrades and application upgrades and stuff like this? So this is something we have some experience with because we've been doing this for 10 years at Google and we, uh, yeah, we've solved a lot of these problems in terms of these internal system that we call Borg, but we're not allowed to call it Borg in public because you know, the Star Trek people have phasers. So. <laughs> <laughs> and it's important to say, so this is sort of an open source uh, project based on our experience and how we see the right way to run cluster management, container management. Um, it actually includes a lot of the lessons that we wish we had known five years ago. So if you want to know what we wish we had done, check out the GitHub container at Google. Um, it's also important to say this is not a play to make you run stuff on Google. Um, I hope that you will try it on Google and I hope you will be happy there. But one of the foundation functions is this should run almost anywhere. You should be able to run it on your laptop, on premise, in a different cloud. It's really one of the founding principles is workload portability. Uh, there's also, you can see that by the partners that are participating in the Kubernetes movement, like Microsoft, Red Hat, OpenStack, you know, all of these companies are helping and contributing and driving the design and development. But that's enough of the design principles, since I don't have much time, I'm going to skip all the design principles and go into what are the components in Kubernetes. It breaks down into four things, pods, labels, replication controllers, which take care of that pods, and services, which is how you figure out which pods to reach. So a pod, basically a pod is uh, how you say, these containers always need to live together, need to live and die together. If one of them dies, as an example, if that MySQL database, uh, MySQL container dies, then the, my, the service is sort of useless anyway, so they should all die together. Um, if you need to share a data volume, so you've got one container handling your web server, one container handling your file file puller that keeps a volume up to date that your web server pulls from. This is an example of a pod. Uh, it's the, or the foundation organizational unit inside, in, inside Kubernetes. It uses containers, but it keeps your containers together. Because sometimes you want the containers to always be on the same host, and sometimes it's okay for them to be spread across hosts. Uh, this, is how we, this is how we define that. Uh, the second concept is labels and selectors. So each pod gets labels. It's just metadata that you attach to the pods. And throughout the rest of the system, we use these labels to constantly query the system so we can, so the different other components can know what's the actual current state of the system. So one example is saying, I'd like a query that says, what are all of my front end pods? Or another query that would say, what are all of my pods in the development environment? This is some examples of labels, and now we see why are the labels useful. Because replication controllers, which is how you manage a, a scaling number of, 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 of pods, use these labels to decide, to always check what's the, what's the current state of the system. And it's a typical control loop, uh, observe, rectify, repeat. So one example of that is say, you have a replication controller where we should have four pods. They're distributed across uh, four different nodes or four different hosts, I think, in, the, in this community's language. Say one of those hosts just completely dies, power failure or something like that. 
Um, the replication controller automatically notices that you have three, and it's going to start up a new pod. Oh, two. Wow, OK. Uh, I'm going to skip all the other amazing stuff about replication controllers. Another organization <laughs> is services. So services is also another, just another query on the labels. It says, what pods are in this service? Um, it also handles the load balancing. So the rest of your system wants to reach your Mongo database, says, where's the Mongo service? Gets the IP address, and gets it spread across. Um, you can also use this for your front end. So now I've got a story of how this applies to a rolling upgrade by using these labels and replication control. So we've got a service for the front end, which is load balancing across everything with the label front end. Okay? But then we also have a replication controller that says, hey, so we also have a replication controller making sure that we have four of those running and serving traffic right now. You can also hook up on a scale to this. Say, okay, we actually want to we, we come out with version 1.3. We define a replication controller. The replication controller creates the pod because it says, ooh, you know, there's not a pod label 1.3. Creates the pod. The front end service says, oh hey, that's got the front end label. It has it. And actually now we have, uh, we could stop here and have A B testing uh, with 20% of our traffic going to the new pod. But now we say, okay, change the replication controller three for the 1.2, one of those pods automatically goes away because the replication controller is done. And you continue that story until, uh, you know, you continue like incrementing and decrementing until the last old version dies. Now, say you actually Ooh. wanted to bring that back to life, you wanted to do a rollback, no problem. You just set the replication controller back to one and you spin up your old versions because that template still, still exists. So that's really, really fast core thing. Docker is awesome for controlling your format. Kubernetes is our way of, uh, of the way we wish we had built our co container management tools. And Container Engine, if you want to try this on Google, you can run this on um, a fully managed version of Kubernetes, or you can download Kubernetes and just do it yourself. Um, so I would say oh, that's my last slide. What's next is try it yourself and give feedback. We're super happy with all the input that we got from the Things. It's just pushed us to do things we never would have thought we needed. Um, try it on Google with Container Engine. Uh, watch the a one hour and 15 minute version of this talk by Tim Mockin and Scale 13. <laughs> uh, that's the YouTube link. We have one of the Kubernetes engineers from Warsaw is going to come talk and go to. So come see his talk. And um, chat with me if you want to know about the new cloud platform. And questions? Yes, big round of applause. Come from. Yeah, so good. Yeah, it wasn't time for that. <laughs> it's the Greek word for for the helmsman of a ship. But it's also the root for the word governor and the root for the word cyber. Cyber. Yeah, good question. Other. Uh, Thank you. You say Google is using this one. What? How many of Google's applications are actually running in the internet? All of them are. That's a secret. Gmail, you can open source projects on um, it's a lot longer. If you watch the Tim Hawkins talk, he goes into a lot of details about the differences and why, what's good and bad about the differences. Basically, we really like Docker, we just don't need to Okay, good. Last question. Okay. I got a guy back there who was, can I take his and then yours? Okay, okay. let's, let's pick two then. What's like the, 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 the intended scale to start off with Kubernetes? Okay, so Kubernetes 1.0, the target is 100 nodes. And it's just sort of an arbitrary mark in the sand saying it might go bigger or not. But at a certain point, you have to set a goal for what's the, what's the probable general workload that people run with Kubernetes. And in 1.0, that's 100. Obviously, that's going to change. I mean, obviously, it's going to get bigger. But it gives the engineers who are working on it and the, the people contributing code kind of a target to place to start. So, uh, Docker and all the container technologies, they, they use a set of kernel utilities, right? Yeah. Like kernel functions. Yeah. Do you maintain, so, so yeah, so do you maintain any stuff uh, for your own container technology that might be useful that if you would be merged upstream? Or? I don't know the answer to that question because I'm not on the internal engineering team. Okay. Um, what I will say is, I don't know the answer. I can't answer that well. I sort of don't think so because, like, 
we contributed C groups to the um, to the to the Linux, and that was something that we wanted that we pushed back upstream. And also, there's a lot of other stuff that we wanted for a long time upstream that the rest of the Linux community wasn't really interested in doing. But actually, one of the reasons it's awesome that Docker takes off is now that the Docker community is going crazy with this stuff and doing cool stuff. They're pushing and saying to the Linux upstream community, we really need this. And we're saying, yes, finally. Especially you guys are helping us get the stuff that we wish for in the Linux kernel upstream. That, but that's no specifics, but that's the general story I've heard is internally. Is that I think it's, it, it, it answers to some degree. Okay. Some of the people do well, it's, it's stuff that we want. We, you know, we haven't been able to do it. We could do it internally, but yeah, then we start to get out of sync. Cool. Yeah, all right. Thanks. Thanks.